Pode começar, professor. Hi to everyone. This is our last meeting. We will uh, see uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Lisbeth and Chris Lane that will present uh, the impacts on arts uh, during the pandemics. Uh, so now Chris and Lisbeth will present uh, the impacts in the artist, artistic um, environments during the pandemics. Okay, we, we have prepared a, a short PowerPoint uh, and we, where we discuss the, the visual art system in times of pandemic, that was, which was the, the theme of our investigation in this, uh, in this project led by Professor Edgar and by the University of Lyon with uh, Professor Fabrice and uh, Professor Romain. Uh, we, um, we took in this, uh, in this uh, research, we took a glance at Rio and Sao Paulo circuit. Uh, Cristiane is going to present in Portuguese uh, because we are having a, tra a transmission through YouTube and we have audience. So it's better if she can uh, present the, the same thing I'm, I'm presenting in English. She's going to, to do it in, in Portuguese. Please, Cristiane. Está sem microfone. Então, a gente vai dar continuidade às apresentações anteriores dos estudos que a professora Elisbeth e eu conduzimos sobre o impacto da pandemia, no caso, no sistema das artes visuais, e cujo foco foi o circuito Rio-São Paulo. E a gente vai, então, fazendo a apresentação em inglês e português, eu vou traduzindo ao longo do, 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 do trabalho, eu vou fazendo as duas, a segunda versão. Então, uh, as you remember, uh, we structured uh, our investigation in three moments, and we have already presented the first and the second in the former uh, meeting we have had. And in this meeting, we are uh, going to, to present some information about the new normal and the reopening of the of the of the circuit, the art circuit. And the pub, in this uh, very moment we are going to focus on, the public and the private uh, come back into the actions. We focus the, the institutions and uh, some collections. And we try to show some paradoxes and gaps from the social, culture, and market perspectives. Bom, então, a pesquisa, a gente desenvolveu esse trabalho em, com foco em três momentos, nos antecedentes da indústria cultural, depois nos momentos iniciais, com os fechamentos dos espaços públicos e das instituições, e hoje a gente vai focar no terceiro aspecto, no terceiro, no terceiro momento, em, em dois aspectos, na questão do público e privado, na, nas instituições culturais, e essa, esse paradoxo do mercado e do ambiente cultural. Uh, the public and the private in art space to discuss this, uh, this, uh, this theme, this problem, we focus on the example of the FRAC, the French FRACs, which are uh, the funds uh, the regional funds for art, for contemporary art, and especially we focus on the PACA FRAC, which is the FRAC from Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur, and uh, the MAM de São Paulo. The MAM is the Museum of Modern Art of São Paulo. And in the next uh, image, you can see 
the the place where is uh, located the frac we will be talking about. Então, é, para falar sobre o tema do público e privado nos espaços de arte, a gente tem como referência os estudos de caso do frac Pacá, que é o Fundo Regional de Arte Contemporânea da região de Provence, e o Museu de Arte Moderna de São Paulo, e cujos os edifícios a gente pode ver nas imagens apresentadas aqui no, nos nossos slides. The next, here you can see the location of uh, the frac uh, Provence Art Côte d'Azur. Uh, it was uh, founded in 1982, Uh, it has 30,000 works by 5,700 uh, uh, artists, both French and foreign. It is... é, a gente apresenta um mapa, porque o FRAC está é, distribuído em diversas regiões da França, mas o nosso trabalho é, e a participação que a gente teve e vamos apresentar a seguida se está é, relacionado ao FAC, como comentamos, do de Provence, que está apontado no mapa, que fica em Marseille. Então, uh, the, the FRAC, as we, we have just said, are funds constituted from public art collections as part of a policy of the decentralization of art by the French government. Uh, some of uh, the points we are going to present now were uh, presented by Muriel Enjahan, who is the director of this regional FRAC from Marseille. Uh, and uh, she pointed out that uh, Uh, they have adopted some remote activities during the pandemics and they, the, their teams, the teams were maintained, 100% of its teams were maintained. Uh, the payments already agreed with all artists were made, even with the cancellation of activities such as residences and workshops. She uh, had the perception of the need of a slowdown in the pace of exhibitions, something that she could uh, uh, notice uh, with this experience. And uh, the curatorial project uh, now would be reviewed under the criteria of environmental and economic impacts and social isolation. Uh, and uh, as uh, she, she said in this meeting, the crisis changed the way of thinking and producing art. This is a very interesting and important conclusion. Bom, então, o FRAC, né, ele faz parte desse fundo de várias coleções públicas de arte, que fez parte de um, um, um projeto de descentralização de arte do governo francês nos anos 80, e nós pudemos contar com a diretora da unidade de Pacá, né, da região de Provence, como falamos, nessa, nesse estudo em que ela apresentou alguns pontos para a gente do, das adaptações, do que aconteceu com a, o impacto da pandemia na unidade da, que ela coordena. Então, é, algumas atividades foram convertidas em remoto, né, em atividades remotas, e um ponto muito importante é que 100% das equipes foram mantidas e os salários que já haviam sido acordados com artistas também foram pagos, apesar do cancelamento das atividades como residências e workshops que estavam contratados previamente. É, na, na percepção dela, da equipe, houve a necessidade, houve uma revisão, uma reflexão sobre a necessidade de um abrandamento no ritmo das exposições. E os projetos curatoriais também foram repensados considerando também critérios ambientais, econômicos e a questão do isolamento social. E como uma importante conclusão desse processo, desse momento, foi que é, justamente houve uma reflexão de uma nova forma de pensar e na produção artística. E concerning the MAM de São Paulo, 
uh, we have uh, we had the participation of the chief curator, the artistic chief curator, uh, Kawe Alves. The MUM was founded in 1948. Uh, it has more than 5,000 works produced by uh, the most representative names of modern and contemporary art, mainly Brazilian, in its collection. Então, o outro caso que nós estudamos e tivemos a oportunidade de contar também com a apresentação foi o do Museu de Arte Moderna de São Paulo, fundado em 1948, 1948. Tem um acervo de 5 mil obras com é, grandes representantes da arte moderna contemporânea, principalmente brasileiros. Como uh, eu disse, nós temos o the image, the, a photo of uh, Kawe Alves, the chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, just uh, to, to as an information, uh, the museum is a private museum supported by direct funding and sponsorship through incentive laws. Uh, according to the uh, analysis Kawe Alves has presented us, Uh, the pandemic was a challenge. They, they had already many activities online, but they, they had to go much more beyond physical limits, migrating from a face-to-face -face museum to an online museum. Uh, 30 uh, point uh, thousand in-person visits uh, had, uh, took place uh, during the year of 2020 when there were some opening moments uh, during the pandemic, but online activities were attended by, by 1.4 uh, million people. So they, they had a, a huge uh, number on, uh, in the uh, online audience. Uh, the online programming uh, organized by the museums, uh, besides the museum's website, remote visits in 3D environment and Google Arts coaches that they already had. They created electronic games and strong performance approach by the educational museum team oriented to school to schools during the pandemic. Uh, one of the projects called Mam na Cidade, Mam in the City, reached more than 15 million people considered one of the most far-reaching actions of the institution, just to, just to give an example. But they had other activities. They had uh, some uh, interventions in the city that we are going to see in the next, uh, the next slides. Então, é, nós tivemos a participação do curador-chefe do Museu de Arte Moderna de São Paulo, Cauê Alves, e ele comenta né, na, na sua apresentação que o, o museu ele tem uma natureza privada, com financiamento direto e patrocínio por meio de leis de incentivo. E ele enfatizou que o um principal desafio era ir além dos limites físicos e fazer realmente a migração do museu presencial para o museu online. É, ele deu algumas cifras importantes que ao longo de 2020, né, com os momentos de, que tivemos de reabertura e fechamentos, mas houve cerca de 30 mil visitas presenciais, enquanto que as atividades online contaram com uma participação de 1,4 milhão de pessoas. Na programação online, é, compreendeu tanto o site do museu, visitas remotas em ambiente 3D, o Google Arts and Culture, que já era uma parceria de longa data, mas também a criação de jogos eletrônicos e um importante papel do educativo que estava orientado para as escolas. E aí também, um, a, a, talvez uma das principais, foi uma na cidade, que atingiu cerca de 15 milhões de pessoas, tendo sido, então, na história do museu, uma das de maior alcance, uma das iniciativas de maior alcance. E a gente vai ver algumas imagens. Here you have uh, one of the projections they, they had in the, in the urban space of the city. Uh, o MAM leva o museu até você. Uh, MAM brings the museum to you beyond the park. And this is another 
image that shows us uh, a, a sort of a poster indicating the, the activities uh, people could uh, uh, find in, in the urban space itself. The, uh, this one is uh, installed in a bus stop. Então, essa é uma imagem do, da ação do Humana na Cidade nos pontos de ônibus, em que tinha muitos painéis com obras de arte do acervo da, do museu, e o QR Code levava para alguns podcasts no Spotify. Uh, concerning art fairs, galleries and auctions, we, we, we can point out that the online activities uh, were the very, very strong that in this pandemic period. We had lots of online viewing rooms during the, the art fairs. In Sao Paulo, art fair was completely done online through these online viewing rooms. It was also possible if someone wanted to buy uh, a work of art, they could ask for a presential visit at the gallery. But uh, in general, the, the, the visit was only online. And in Rio de Janeiro, another very important art fair, the Art Rio Fair, Uh, they used it hybrid models because it took place a little later than the Sao Paulo one, and it was uh, already a moment with some opening in the sanitary conditions. Uh, different perceptions and statements about gallery results in Brazil and uh, worldwide came up. Uh, we have uh, records at auctions in the country. And uh, we can we found also a gap between art market, cultural environment, and social economic reality. And this is a, a point that we must uh, uh, highlight. Uh, I'm going to present here two, two statements from the directors of the art fair. Uh, the first statement is by Tam Tamara Perlman from Feira Party, she's the director. And she said, uh, this is her analysis, the main correlation that exists for the growth of the art market is less connected to the growth of the country's wealth, but with the growth in the number of rich individuals and millionaires. And the second statement is by Fernanda Feitosa, who is the director of SP Art, And she said, in times of economic crisis, some assets become safe havens as they are less subject to fluctuations. Works of art have this character. It's like investing in gold with the advantage of generating enormous well being for the buyer. Bom, então, olhando na dimensão mais mercadológica do ambiente cultural e das artes visuais, é, a gente tem as feiras de arte, a, as galerias e os leilões. É, basicamente, a SP Arte, por exemplo, adotou as atividades online com os OVR, VRs, né, que é em inglês, é uma sigla em inglês para as salas de visualização online das, das obras de arte. É, já a Arte Rio ado conseguiu adotar um modelo híbrido com atividades presenciais e online. É, a gente pôde identificar uma, uma diferenças na percepção, nas afirmações sobre os resultados das galerias no Brasil e no mundo. A gente também identificou, houve um recorde em leilões no Brasil. E um, um ponto importante, então, como conclusão dessas, desse, desse estudo quanto ao mercado, é essa, essa lacuna entre o mercado de arte, o ambiente cultural e a realidade socioeconômica do Brasil, do país. É, a gente tem duas, duas declarações que reforçam esse aspecto, uma é da Tamara Perman, que é diretora de uma feira, uma feira que é a Feira Parte, em que ela comenta, a principal correlação que existe para o crescimento do mercado de arte está menos ligada ao crescimento da riqueza do país, mas com o crescimento do número de ricos e milionários. E já a Fernanda Feitosa, da, da, que é a diretora da SP Arte, ela enfoca o aspecto de que, em tempos de crise econômica, alguns ativos 
tornam-se como portos seguros, pois estão menos sujeitos às oscilações. As obras de arte têm esse caráter, é como investir em ouro, com a vantagem de gerar enorme bem-estar para o comprador. Caipirinha, from 1923, it's a work by Tarsila do Amaral, was uh, sold for 57.5 million reais, around 11 million dollars, in an auction that lasted 15 minutes, setting a new record for Brazilian art. It was uh, done, this auction was, uh, took place at the Bolsa de Arte de São Paulo. Então, os exemplos que a gente acabou de comentar, a gente pode trazer o caso do, da venda da Caipirinha, que é uma obra da Tarsila do Amaral, uma obra de 1923, e que foi vendida por 57,5 milhões de reais, cerca de 11 milhões de dólares, e um leilão que durou cerca de 15 minutos e estabeleceu esse novo recorde da arte brasileira, e o leilão foi conduzido pela Bolsa de Arte de São Paulo. Uh, so... We must take these examples from the, from the art market and put them in contrast to uh, the number. First, let's take a look at the number or super rich in the country uh, that jumped from 44% from 45% in 2020 to 65% in 2021. A group that holds together 2019.1 uh, uh, billion dollars, something like 1.2 uh, trillion of Brazilian reais. Uh, we must contrast this information with uh, the 4.1% drop in Brazil cross domestic product from 2020. 12. Uh, 0.8% of the population was below the extreme poverty line, receiving 246 reais per month. It's around uh, 45 dollars. Bom, então alguns números que explicitam essa lacuna que a gente apontou e essa correlação também apresentada. É, por exemplo, a questão do aumento do número de super ricos no país, que saltou, aumentou em 44%, de 45 pra, em 2020 para 65 em 2021, um grupo que detém 219 bilhões de dólares, ou 1,2 trilhão de reais. Ao mesmo tempo, em, em comparação, a gente teve uma queda no produto interno bruto do país, de, de, comparado a 2020, de 4,1%. E a população, cerca de 26 milhões de pessoas, ou 12,8%, é, esteve abaixo da linha de extrema pobreza, o que e, e com um, um recebimento de cerca de 246 reais por mês, ou 45 dólares por mês. This is a image from... Uh one exhibition that was took place in Rio de Janeiro at the Museu do Amanhã, Tomorrow Museum, uh, where uh, they, they had as a main question, uh, are we witnessing a new era? It was uh, called Corona Seno, the, the exhibition. And uh, uh, during the, uh, the presentation of, the, of this exhibit, Uh, the, the exhibition curator uh, uh, formulated a, a thought about what was happening in this pandemic moment. We are going to read it right now. Então, só para só para enfatizar essa é a foto de uma exposição que acontece no Museu da Manhã e e que traz como questão, né? se tudo isso que estamos vivendo é, estabelece, então, uma nova era, se estamos testemunhando uma nova era. E o the, 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 the statement by the curator is the following. Art helped to overcome the difficult times. Culture not only brought well-being to moments of greater social isolation, 
mental well-being, but also allowed this resilience using creativity as a way for us to show that yes, we will go through all this, all of this. This is what we wanted to present. We thank you very much. Então, como conclusão, né, o curador dessa exposição, ele, como, como cerne da exposição, ele trouxe a ideia de que a arte ajudou a superar os tempos difíceis, em que a cultura não só trouxe bem-estar a momentos de maior isolamento social, bem-estar mental, mas também permitiu essa resiliência, usando a criatividade como forma de mostrarmos que sim, vamos passar por tudo isso. Então, era o que nós tínhamos para mostrar hoje e agradecemos. Thank you, Chris and uh, Professor Lisbeth. It was very interesting. Now we will open to some questions that uh, other colleagues could uh, uh, may, could uh, uh, conduct to you. To you. And uh, I will uh, ask, uh, and I will present that today we will have Professora Janaína from FEA here too, uh, to participate with us. So now it's open to some questions. I have one specific question that it, uh, it's more one demand for explanation. It will be interesting if you could explain for the people what is a frack? Because frack is not uh, a common institution for us. It will be interesting to explain what is a frack in France. Uh, it's a kind of uh, exposition. It will be to talk about some think about the frack to people uh, who don't know what is a frack. We, we have just uh, pointed out uh, during our presentation that they are funds, they are uh, physical places where you can uh, find the cultural activities and the collection and art. And you have exhibitions, you have performance, you have many sorts of uh, conferences, many workshops, many sorts of uh, cultural activities. Uh, it, uh, this is, uh, as we said, a part of the, the policy for decentralization of art by the, the French government. As we showed in the map, there are fracks all around the country, and all, all of them are very much uh, active. They offer a very good uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural events uh, to, to the public that... Uh, uh, live nearby the place. Perhaps the French colleagues can say something more. I, I've known myself some of the frags from, from uh, the north part of the country, from Rennes, from that region of the Bretagne region. And it's really a very interesting uh, uh, possibility for people to have a cultural experience. But let's listen to the, the French colleagues. I'm not a big specialist, <laughs> but I agree with what you said. That's a place designed for, uh, for art and for uh, people who can meet. And sometimes there are some special events. But uh, I'm not a big specialist <laughs> on that aspect. You're better than I. <laughs> can I add something? Yes, of course. It's better uh, if we translate a little bit after you. Yeah, I, I will do that. É, então, o, o FRAC, ele traz essa, como foi uma iniciativa governamental, né, nos anos 80, para descentralizar, para dar acesso às coleções de artes. A gente imagina, por exemplo, ainda mais o nosso trabalho que foi é, com foco no circuito São, de arte de São Paulo e Rio, então, é uma forma de você levar o acervo de arte contemporânea para várias regiões, não ficar tão centralizado em grandes museus e muitas vezes em museus privados, né? como a gente tem aqui em São Paulo, o próprio MAM, o próprio MASP. E, e, então, é uma forma de, de você sem, descentralizar as coleções, trazer isso para as próprias regiões. 
Então, acho que era só para deixar mais claro, e é uma iniciativa pública. Né? It's a public initiative. It's a kind of cultural space to present arti uh, cultural activities, including paintings and presentations and every kind of uh, cultural activity. Seminar. Specialized in modern art. Please, okay. please, go on. It's just specialized in modern art. It's dedicated to modern art. Modern and contemporary. And contemporary, contemporary. And contemporary. Yeah. Yes, very interesting. Uh, and uh, one uh, another question to this batch and to Chris. Uh, based in your personal observation in the interviews, what are the main lessons that you can take um, for this experience of the uh, social isolation and uh, do, and the, its impacts in the cultural environment. What do you think, Chris and Lisbeth? Lisbeth have a lot of experience that will change, and uh, after this this period. The, uh, I, I'm trying to to say in English, and then Chris Cristelli oh. tries to to say something in Portuguese. Um, the, the experience shows that uh, uh, the culture, cultural life uh, was essential at, at this moment. It was a possibility, it was a, something that could, could take uh, people outside the isolation because it was possible to follow uh, many experiences. For, for instance, uh, for instance, uh, there was a commemoration around El Greco during this period in uh, the museum from all over Europe that have El Greco in the collection uh, presented and commented the work they have in the collection. So it was a tour through many museums to, to think about the work of art by this artist. Uh, this, uh, it, it was an online activity and uh, the audience uh, had the opportunity to, 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 to see these works, to see these works and to compare them. It, uh, before we didn't have tho those sort of activities. In, in a certain uh, point of view, we, we could uh, have new opportunities of uh, experiencing art, even if it is not in person, but experiencing art and have many information about what is going on uh, uh, at the different museums in different countries, to take part in some webinars. So it was uh, a moment, a very rich moment to exchange information. But we must also um, underline, we must also highlight that in this comparison that we had between the French um, uh, activities and the Brazilian ones, it was completely different. Here in Brazil, we didn't, we had problem of, pe many people were fired, the, especially the education, the people who worked in the education field, they lost their jobs. Artists had to, to do um, a, a sort of league and they put some works in this uh, uh, collective exhibition. They, uh, if they reach, uh, they uh, were able to sell uh, a work, they divide what they earn between the, the whole group. They had to take some activities and some initiatives like that because it was necessary to survive. Everything was closed and those who have uh, a good interest in the market could have some work sell, but sold, but uh, those who have not, it was more difficult, especially for those who are activists, who works in the contemporary art field, where they, they work with performances, with workshops, and uh, this sort of um, uh, manifestation. So it was quite different. We, had, uh, we haven't had any support from the 
the public uh, sphere, from the government. The, the institution maintain themselves with some difficulties. If they are private in Brazil, museums are mainly private. There are, there are public museums, but in the, in the art field, the main museums are not uh, public. We have the MAC, we have the Pinacoteca, but we have some sort of um, uh, um, uh, mainly the, the maintenance is made by, uh, by uh, foundations and uh, people who, who put their money for the, the culture life uh, following the, the conditions the, of, the, of the incentive laws. Do inside these conditions, see? So it's quite different uh, from a country where the, the culture has the, uh, the government support. It is a public sphere. It's really a public sphere. That's quite different, you see? Christiane, do you want to add something? Na verdade, eu traduzi e tentar adicionar pouca coisa, mas acho que é, é essencial, a, a essência é isso mesmo, professora. Uh, então, a arte foi essencial, né? ela se mostrou essencial durante esse período de isolamento, como a gente até comentou, em termos de saúde mental, e, mas, ao mesmo tempo, mostrou a fragilidade das nossas políticas públicas, porque a gente tem uma, desde os anos 90, a gente vive um contexto de privatização da cultura, então a grande parte das nossas, das nossas instituições dependem de, de iniciativas privadas, leis de incentivo que contam com, essa, é, com o patrocínio de empresas, então isso ficou muito claro durante esse período e as nossas instituições não estavam preparadas para toda essa atividade digital, porque uma coisa é a digitalização de acervos, outra coisa é a experiência virtual. Então, muito rapidamente conseguiram, alguns conseguiram se adaptar, mas o que a gente viu, aqueles que tinham maiores investimentos, né conseguiram ter uma, uma adaptação maior ao ambiente online e oferecer uma programação online. E também explicitou uma crise estrutural que a gente tem né, como eu comentei, dessa questão pública, e, mas de muitos, é, da nossa infraestrutura cultural, museus, incêndios, que a gente, infelizmente, vem deflagrando nos últimos anos de acervos, com uma perda de acervos absurda. E, e também foi importante ver a união, a, uma rede de artistas que se formaram como forma de subsistência. Então, se reuniam para fazer a venda das suas obras e ainda mais quando a gente pensa na arte contemporânea que trabalha com performance e com outros, outros suportes, outras formas de fazer arte, essa rede de apoio artística foi, foi fundamental para subsistência, para sobrevivência. Tivemos algumas poucas leis, como a lei Aldi Blanc, que pode né, atingir um pouco mais a, a ponta de produtores culturais e artistas, mas não o suficiente, como a professora mencionou, a perda de empregos, principalmente nas áreas de, do educativo, que justamente não estão na linha de frente né, dessas iniciativas artísticas, houve uma grande perda, muitas pessoas que tiveram tanto redução de salário quanto perderam seus empregos. Acho que é isso. Just one uh, reflection. Lisbeth, do you, and Chris, do you believe that this model of FRAC could be an interesting model to be adopted in Brazil? Because the, the French model, you have great museums like Louvre, but you have the FRAC. The FRAC is small expositions. Do you think that this could be implemented someday in Brazil? Because, uh, what do you think about this? Do, do, uh, you, it would be wonderful, but of this. we don't have a, a, a tradition of uh, a public, a very strong public support to culture, you see? Uh, this is something that is very much present uh, in our uh, 
institutional art history. You find um, some museums that were created from uh, the 90s, uh, since the 90s, they were created when we still were and we had uh, the emperor as, a, as a, a governor. In that moment, there were more support for the cultural field. Then when we became a republic, uh, we had the art academies, the Ecole de, de Beaux-Arts, uh, and but the, all the other activities were made with the sponsorship of private uh, foundation. Even the creation of the modern art museum it was discussed here since the, the 30s, 1930s. Uh, it was uh, since the time of Mario de Andrade, Serge Millier, and the, the very important intellectuals that were active at that time. Uh, they tried to do through Sao Paulo City, uh, to Sao Paulo City, a government administration, but it was not possible. So in the 40s, what happened? It is the Rockefeller Foundation who is going to give some support and enthusiasm for the foundation of uh, a mom in Sao Paulo, and it is a private mom, a private mom that had as a, a sponsor, uh, Titilo Matarazzo, that was an industrial. That was the profile of the, of the creation of our museums. The same with MASP, which is the Museum uh, of Sao Paulo that has also a very important international collection. It's the same thing, the same thing. It was Assis Chateaubriand, a uh, personality from the communication field from that had the, uh, uh, it was a pioneer in, in, ha in having a, a net of uh, uh, newspapers all around the country, uh, the first television and all that, but uh, uh, that obtained the, the, the private support to create that collection. There is no uh, a tradition for a public uh, policy uh, toward culture, culture here. It's completely different from the American, North American, the United States experience. It's different. Então, eu vou, vou comentar um pouco em português. É, a professora Lisbeth traz um ponto muito importante, que é a questão, a gente tem uma questão histórica do nosso investimento em cultura, em arte, Talvez no, no período imperial tivemos uma presença talvez um pouco mais estatal, mas a gente tem uma matriz privada de investimento, de formação do nosso, da nossa Centro Estrutura Cultural e Artística. Desde os, se a gente pega, a gente vai, comer, vai celebrar o centenário da Semana de Arte Moderna, né, professora? E temos, a gente tem uma elite cultural envolvida, é, privada, como o Paulo Prado, é, depois a gente tem Mário de Andrade, Sérgio Mulier, que são importantes intelectuais. E quando a gente pensa em instituições culturais, como os museus de arte moderna, na base tem o um investimento, por exemplo, de Rockefeller, quando esteve né, no, no Brasil, nas suas investidas geopolíticas, teve a, a utilização das instituições culturais como base dessas, dessa estratégia, e depois o título como também o industrial, que vai investir em arte, o Bard, no MASP. Então, essa tem sido a nossa, a nossa história em termos de cenário, de infraestrutura, de circuito, de um sistema das artes no Brasil, tendo na sua fundação o, a, o capital privado e a, essa essa burguesia, né? e não com o acesso público. E aí eu só adiciono, é, eu sou uma pessoa que, que viaja muito pelo interior do nosso Brasil, dos rincões assim, do Brasil, e aí você vê a discrepância em termos de investimentos, da gente pensar, seria fantástico, a gente ter um modelo francês, eu acho, dessa descentralização de acervos, mas os museus locais, museus é, de outros que não estejam nesse grande, nas grandes capitais, não praticamente não recebem investimentos e estão com seus acervos correndo o risco de pegar fogo, de serem incinerados, enfim, é bem difícil. Edgar? Sim, sim. Sim. 
maybe we can make our presentation. It was very interesting, and uh, especially with uh, talking with uh, French art. But due to the time here in France, perhaps we can start. <laughs> Romain and I. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I will. I will ask if someone have another additional question, and if no. <laughs> so no one has, <laughs> I will finish our presentation. Uh, it was a pleasure to have. Uh, do you have a question, Janine? Yes, I, but it's a quick okay. question. Yes, yes. So first of all, I, I just like to uh, congratulate the researchers. It was, it was a very interesting seminar very rich data. And I was just wondering here, uh, what do you think were the main challenges for offering in a short amount of time, so many activities, so many online activities, um, the IT problems or I don't know, security problems. What challenges do you think were the, the main ones for this? Uh, I don't think that, I think that uh, there was a, a very important opening for spreading the information, spreading the, the uh, activities to different parts of the country. We had the participation of people from all over the country. This is a possibility to through digital means. And this is, this is indeed very important. And I think that from now on, the museums will have uh, will have to, to maintain this sort of activity. They are going to have physical activity, presential activities, but also to offer this possibility to, to people from other parts or other cities of the, of the different states and other parts of the country. It's something that we can feel also in, in education, uh, in, in, in our activities, at the university now, our classes in our class we have the presence of uh, students from all over the country. It's possible for them to participate, to interact with colleagues from different parts of the world. I think that the the challenge will be to maintain all that. And of course, there are the the problem always the problem of uh, having a Wi-Fi, of having internet in, in the poor parts of, of the cities, the different uh, uh, social uh, classes have uh, more, uh, the lower classes have more difficult to have internet to, to be contacted. But it is a sort of opening that uh, we had and proved to work. And we okay. must follow this experience. And perhaps for those uh, public museums that exist in the country, it is also uh, a possibility to be more known all over the country, to be more visited. There are many, many, many small. Uh, it, it is not the case to say that there are no public museums. There are. There are many historical museums, thematic museums, and also some uh, small art museums, but without the possibility of developing a strong program towards the society. So the, the digital activity is uh, a door that opens uh, new directions. Vou colocar muito brevemente. É... Na verdade, representa uma, uma grande oportunidade de atingir um, um outro público, né? de poder ter um, uma, dar um maior acesso ao público brasileiro. Eu só adicionaria que é, a gente, isso é um ponto que a gente não trabalhou muito hoje, que a gente vai colocar isso no nosso relatório, no nosso ensaio final, que é o aspecto de que a gente já vinha de uma grande crise no setor cultural. Né? Então, desde quando a gente fala das opções de entretenimento, o museu não era uma das primeiras opções, então já tinha o desafio de, de, de acesso, de, de chegar a esse público, mas é óbvio que também com as atividades via internet, a, a gente teve, tiveram que enfrentar a falta de acesso ainda, a gente tem uma, uma grande parte da população fora dessa rede, então isso é, sim, 
no empecilho, então a gente tem uma questão educacional de acesso a, a, a esses estabelecimentos, ao interesse por as, de mais exposições, como uma dificuldade física, mas isso, na verdade, tem se convertido numa grande oportunidade de maior acesso, de maior alcance. Eu queria agradecer a todos os nossos colegas. I would like to thank to our colleagues for those discussions during this year. It was very, very good moments to reflect, to discuss. Foram momentos muito bons para discutir, para a questão da Covid and his impacts on social life. And um, I will suggest to uh, uh, Chris and Lisbeth, I was just thinking that we can have some fracs at the University of Sao Paulo. We have many campus in the uh, in the Sao Paulo State. Don't have uh, this this campus. This uh, campus don't have a uh, space of artistic activities. And I was just thinking with me that uh, this model of fracs is very interesting. And the University of Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, you have cultural space, but outside of Sao Paulo capital, you, uh, at the university, we don't have many cultural spaces to expose issues like the facts. It, uh, I, I think that the, besides this, this the, the, there is this lesson that we, can, we need to Uh, expand the the artistic environment to be to be more accessible to others. Eu acho que a gente deveria trabalhar um pouco essa ideia do frac, que é muito interessante também para para os campos do interior da USP, né? So uh, it it was my pleasure to have uh, these meetings. Now we will elaborate one. Uh, ending report. Uh, we have one month to uh, elaborate this report, and uh, we are open to ideas to uh, construct this report. Eu vou estar uh, enviando para vocês, né? Ideias. I will send ideas, and we can exchange ideas to construct the final report of this project. It was a very great pleasure for me. We, we want to thank also this opportunity, uh, I myself and Christiane, the opportunity of being uh, working with you, exchanging ideas with uh, this group. And we hope that uh, in the future we can have some presential opportunity to, to exchange Uh, our experiences here in Sao Paulo or in France. Okay. France. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure for us to work with you. It was a pleasure for me as well. I'm sorry I couldn't be present here in the last meetings, um, but I worked together with Edgar in our report. And I'm very pleased to be here today and finally meet you. And I hope to see you in the future, hopefully in France. Ok, vas-y Romain, partage. Ok, so I, I will start first. Uh, thank you, Edgar, and all the team to organize this uh, all this set of events. Um, Roma and I were going to talk to you about um, an exploratory, uh, exploratory research about uh, studying the perception of COVID-19 vaccine, both in France and in, and in Brazil, using social networks. Okay. 
our main uh, our main question the main the goal of uh, of this research is to find a way to assess perceptions differences about covid-19 vaccine both in france and the, in uh, in brazil do you want to translate perhaps this question uh, chris Sorry, I was not prepared for it. <laughs> ah, okay, no, 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 no issues. I, I will speak very slowly okay. English in order to be understood. Okay, next one. So we were talking about social networks. We, for this uh, uh, preliminary exploratory uh, research, we focus on Twitter. Um, Twitter, because uh, first it's, it's uh, very used by politics and influencers. Second, global. Acho que ele caiu, não? A conexão dele, será? No, I think we have lost Jean Fabrice. We lost the communication. Yes, I can take the relay if uh, it's lost. Maybe he will join us in a few minutes. A problem of internet connection, it, it occurs. So um, we worked on the social network Twitter, which is a well-known social network uh, for several reasons. The one of them is uh, that it is used by some politics and some influencers. Um, it also have some links with other social networks. And there is also a practical reason. Uh, we can gather quite easily, a little bit quite easily, uh, automatically, the tweets on Twitter. Uh, it's quite an open network. Uh, we just would like to mention that um, Brazil has a lot of users in Twitter, and Brazil has twice as many users as France. So it's 16.2 million versus 8 million for France. So we performed the data extraction. And uh, for that, we used a software called R, which is a well-known software used by statistician, mathematician. It is a free software, open source software. And in this software, we can add some packages. So we use the package R tweet, which allow to this package allows to gather automatically, to extract automatically uh, some tweets in Twitter, and then thanks to the software R, we are able to analyze uh, the, the data we have extracted. So, what is the uh, our data set? We focus on a ten day period from July the 8th to July the 17th. So that was the summer. And we extracted a, a big amount of data, uh, 115 uh, megabytes. Um, and we would like, we would compare France and Brazil opinion on the social network about vaccine. So for France, we extracted the word uh, all the tweets containing the word vaccine, and for Brazil, all the tweets containing the word vaccina. If you want, I can translate. Sorry? Uh, if you want, I can translate to Portuguese. Uh, if my English, maybe I can speak more no, no. slowly. No, no, or... no, no, your English is very good. No, it's perfect. But if you want. I don't know if, if, if there you is. Want, a lot you can of translate to Portuguese. Okay, if there uh, is some people in YouTube that need to be translated, yes. If you want to translate some parts or the whole as you want. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I will briefly translate what you okay. present. Eles vão usar o software R, vão analisar a palavra vacina e vacin em francês, português. Uh, para estar tá analisando esse período de julho, de, do, de 8 de julho a 17 de julho de 2021, né? como capturaram o, via rede 150 megabytes. Uh, uh, Jean-Fabrice is here, so Jean-Fabrice, do you want to continue? 
Yes, okay, sorry, uh, network issue. <laughs> um, so we collected uh, not a huge data set, but a representative data set with uh, nearly 500,000 uh, 500, tweets and retweets, and uh, globally twice the number from Brazil. But as the population of user in Brazil is, is uh, double, so that explains this, uh, this different difference in numbers of, uh, of tweets. And um, globally, we had some uh, original tweets, so not retweet or quoted, uh, 40% and 60%. Next one. Just uh, first quantitative analysis uh, by uh, the timeline and the number of tweets. We can explain some peaks, for example, regarding France. Um, there, were, uh, there was a, a speech from our, uh, our president, from uh, President Macron, about, uh, about uh, vaccination and about uh, what we call a sanitary pass. And uh, he was on, uh, on the TV. So that's why when a uh, president is talking on TV, there is a, a huge impact on, uh, on Twitter. So that explains this, uh, this peak, this blue peak. And now I, let the, I give the floor to Roma. So now we are going to analyze the tweet. And in the first part, I'm going to present our result on the content of the tweet. That is the text itself, the hashtags found on the tweet, uh, and also the emojis. So we begin, I begin to present the hashtags. Here are the most frequent hashtags occurring in tweets retweeted more than 50 times. On the left hand side, this is the result for Brazil. And on the right hand side, this is the result for France. First, we can see some common feature like the name of the disease, so COVID-19 COVID here. So I, I just want to highlight it. Okay, so the name of the disease. So in France and in Brazil, maybe on several aspects, COVID, or sometimes we can have the word coronavirus. Uh, we have also words related to vaccine, such as vaccination, or here, words related to uh, vaccine. This is not surprising because this is the topic of our analysis. So this is not surprising. Um, in France, we have the name of the president here, which occurs as a frequent hashtag. So it occurs either alone, Macron, or either with um, a specification, which means 8 p.m., because it is the time of the speech of the president on July the 12th, it was at 8 p.m. The difference with Brazil, that it is that in Brazil, we also find the name of the president Bolsonaro, but it is almost always uh, associated with an adjective and um, very often a negative adjective which reflects an opposition to the president. So we have the name of the president very often associated with a negative adjective reflecting the opposition. In France, we have a link made um, with the speech of President Macron. The aim of the speech of President Macron, the announcement was the mandatory vaccination for people working in hospital and the sanitary pass that is uh, the restriction to some public places like restaurant only to vaccinated people. So we find that either as a neutral uh, hashtag, pass sanitaire, which means sanitary pass or vaccin obligatoire, mandatory uh, vaccination. But very often we find uh, negative aspect or hashtags reflecting an opposition to these measures. For instance, we have the shame pass, anti-vax, no to mandatory vaccination, no to vaccination here, 
so we are we have uh, some hashtags uh, reflecting the opposition to this measure. As a result, we see one difference between uh, Brazil and France. This is the following: in Brazil, the opposition seems to target directly the president Bolsonaro, whereas in France, the opposition targets the decisions taken by the president Macron. Um, another aspect that we can see here is the name of pharmaceutical lab. In France, uh, the first lab that we found is Pfizer, and then we have Moderna. We are in Brazil, uh, the first one is AstraZeneca, uh, and then we have Pfizer, but we also have Janssen and Covaxin. And Coronavac. Coronavac is a one Chinese vaccine that was that okay. there is here in Brazil. Coronavac is another famous vaccine here. Coronavac. Okay. Okay, we, we do not have this in France. In France, we only have uh, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Janssen, and AstraZeneca. Um, now, another aspect of analyzing the content of the tweet is to consider the emojis. Uh, an emoji translates an emotion and is a common language. Here are the accumulated retweets by emoji. I only show the top 10 for Brazil on the left and France on the right. And first, let's see the common feature. Uh, we find as a common feature, the syringe, which is not surprising because it is closely related to the topic of our analysis, which is the vaccine. And then another common feature is the flag that represent that may represent the official or governmental speeches. Another common feature is the presence of warning signs here for Brazil and here for France, and maybe for France, warning signs are more numerous than in Brazil, but it remains a common feature. Uh, now let us focus on the differences. For France, except the last emoji here, we do not have an emoji with a positive feelings. Whereas in Brazil, we have some emojis with positive feelings, including this one, meaning that, okay, the vaccination is done, or the number two, meaning that, okay, uh, I had my second dose of vaccine. In France, the skeptical emoji here is at the second place. And this skeptical emoji um, uh, translate a doubt. Some people are doubting or skeptical. They may be skeptical about the true effect of the vaccine or the side effect of the vaccine, or they are skeptical about the government measures. A way to analyze the content of text is to perform a sentiment analysis. This is based on a kind of lexicon that associate to some words a sentiment. A text may have several sentiments, and here we focus on the dominant sentiment of the tweet. Our question is to know which sentiment, which feeling is spread in the network. That is, which sentiment is highly retweeted. If we consider the average number of retweets per dominated sentiment, for tweets that were retweeted more than 500 times, then we see some significant differences between Brazil and France. For Brazil, the sentiment of anger is clearly on top position, whereas in France, it is the sentiment of fear. A common feature, uh, maybe more pronounced in France, is that the sentiment of joy and also the sentiment of surprise um, does not generate so much retreats. And in Brazil, we have joy here and surprise here, but also sadness that does not generate uh, so much retreats. Now, in a second part, we analyze the users that wrote the tweet, and we are particularly interested 
on important or influent users. That is, we want to know what are the characteristics of influent users in both countries. First, we look for the most active accounts. That is the user that wrote the most tweets, the highest number of tweets about vaccine during our 10 day period of study. In this table, we have the top 10 users ranked by decreasing order of the number of tweets written during this period. And we could see first that the number of tweets written during 10 days is high or very high because it is more than 100 or it is more than 200 and sometimes more than 300 tweets written in 10 days. There are two factors explaining this high number of written messages. And these factors are related to the nature of the account. An account, a Twitter account, could be a news feed, a media, and the news about vaccine is rich. For instance, for Brazil, we have here a news feed, or we have here a journalist, or a news portal here. And in France, uh, we do not have official news feed, but we have one account here making a press review. The other explanation for high number of tweets written during 10 days is that a personal account had copy pasted several times the same message. And for France, if we look at these messages, it concerns essentially accounts which are either against the vaccine that we called anti-vax or against the sanitary past announced by uh, President Macron. We call them anti-pass or maybe people skeptical, uh, skeptical about the, the vaccine or the side effects of the vaccine or people that are against the government globally or against the measures taken by the government to fight the pandemic. So we have a lot of accounts here in France which are skeptical or against the vaccine or against the measure taken by the government. This is the difference between France and Brazil because in Bra on the Brazilian side, we see much more official or political account than on the French side. On the Brazilian side, we have here a political account. We have here an official account. Here we have an official account of a research lab and newsfeed or journalist can be seen also as official accounts. Whereas in France, we see a lot of personal accounts and mainly users that are skeptical or against vaccine and sanitary pass. We can see, uh, yes? Just one question. This, this information, Gado the Cedar, what is this uh, description of this kind of tweets? When? You will explore this in oh. Brazil, Gado the Cedar? Yes, so here for the Brazil side or in the front side, there is the name of the Twitter account. And I just give a quick description. The quick description here that I give, I wrote this description. Um, I found that either by looking at the account, sometimes the account, a Twitter account, there is a small description. So in English, in French or in Portuguese, so I can translate it and have an idea of the kind of the account or sometimes by reading the tweets written. So I've made that yes, with yes. the French I, point I, of view. I, I, I was just observing this because uh, here in Brazil, uh, they, probably the skeptical could, could come from Gado de Cedar because Gado is a word that uh, people prefer to people that support the president. The Bolsonaro president was against vaccination. And probably if you explore more of this, 
probably you will find the skeptical side in Gado the city. Uh, Gado is is a, a not uh, it's not a, as informal way to to ask against to talk against the vaccination. Probably the skeptical is here. Uh, okay. You you have a, a great difference. In Brazil, you have a lot, a strong support for vaccination, and not skeptical. Only, only appears skeptical the uh, tweets associated with the president that is skeptical mm -hmm. uh, against vaccination. The Bolsonaro is against is against vaccine. Yes, and I think this is also a difference that we are going to see in the next slides, and. Uh, we are going in the next slide that in Brazil, the most important account or the most influent account are mainly politicians. Whereas in France, we have unknown people, uh, personal accounts. So this is the difference that you uh, highlight. And maybe we can say that in France, we have already seen that phenomenon a few years ago with the yellow jacket phenomenon in France, where unknown people were striking, were demonstrating, uh, and were often, often seen in the medias uh, fighting against some measures of the, of the government. So um, I think everything will be uh, confined with the next slide. And I apologize if I do not go in depth the detail of the Brazilian side. It was just because I'm not really aware of the Brazilian uh, accounts and the Portuguese uh, language. So uh, the French side may be more detailed uh, and more interpreted than the Brazilian side. Um, writing a lot of uh, tweets does not imply that the message will be spread. So that's why in this slide, we focus on influent users. So there are several definitions of being influent. Here, here is the definition that we took to uh, build this two table. Uh, we said that a user, an account is influent if he managed to write twice a tweet highly retweeted. And we mean highly retweeted, 1000 retweets for Brazil, and 500 retweets for France. This difference just reflects the difference of users in the network that we have seen uh, at the beginning of the presentation. So on the Brazilian side, we extract eight accounts. That means that there are eight accounts that wrote at least twice a tweet retweeted more than 1,000 times. So, um, and in France, we found 10 accounts uh, that managed to write twice a tweet retweeted more than 500 times. So in Brazil, over these eight accounts, seven of them are politicians. So among them, we have um, some, uh, we have of course the president of Brazil, we have some deputy and we have some senators and here it is an official uh, account. Uh, it seems to be an official account for the government. So over eight accounts, important accounts, seven are politicians and one is a journalist. In France, we have only two politicians, the Minister of Health and a deputy of the National Assembly. Politically, she is very left and she is very opposed to uh, the government. We have some journalists or some news feed on newspaper. And then there are some spaces for other kind of accounts, such as, let's say, semi-personal or semi-professional account. Here we have a lawyer. Here we have an economist. And then we have two accounts here and here which are accounts that are opposed to the vaccine or opposed to the sanitary pass. So we find here also a difference between the two countries. 
whereas in Brazil, influential accounts are mainly politicians or journalists, in France, this is more diverse. And some personal accounts opposed to the government decisions are arising. Unknown people are arising. Now I focus on the network aspect because in Twitter, users can interact through the retweet action or through the quote action. These interactions define a network. The node of the network are the user. And there is a link between user A and user B from user A to user B if user A retweets or quotes a tweet of user B. Just note that in this preliminary work, we do not consider the follower or the friendship link, which define another network. This could be done in a future analysis. Um, note also that in order to perform comparisons between Brazil and France, we consider here two distinct, two different networks, the one for Brazil and the one for France. Uh, although these two networks could be considered as a single one network because it is in the Twitter network. So here you just can see the number of nodes in the network and the number of links in the network and just realize that we are dealing with big networks. So in this network, if we focus on uh, popular users, that is user having the highest number of incoming links, so a lot of number of incoming links. So you have here the top 10 users for each country, that is the users that are the most retweeted or quitted for their tweets about the vaccine written during the 10 day period of our analysis. Well, for Brazil in first position, uh, we find a kind of exception uh, she is a law student, and in fact, she wrote a single tweet, just one tweet about vaccine, but it was massively retweeted or quoted. And except this user, the rest of the accounts concern politicians or journalists. So the rest here are either politicians or journalists. In France, Politicians or journalists are only half of these top 10 accounts. We have the president, uh, we have the minister of health, and we have the first TV channel. We have a news feed here, and a journalist, but she is also an anti-vax or anti-sanitary pass. The other half is personal or professional accounts, we find again here the lawyer, and we find here also um, a biopharmacy professor, and then we find anti-vax or anti-pass accounts. So here again in France, we found that important Twitter accounts are not only politicians, or journalists, but there, are, there is also some accounts, uh, personal accounts, unknown people on the mainstream media, uh, which are arising in the Twitter network because of their position against the vaccine or against the sanitary pass or against the government. Well, several factors could explain this result. One of them is that our study took place in July during the announcement of President Macron to restrict the access to certain places only to vaccinated people. Uh, this announcement uh, was very strong and it can be seen as a trigger for a form of opposition that we see on this social network. Now we focus on the French network only with the aim to extract community. I just remind that what is a community? A community in a social network is a set of nodes highly interconnected. That is a set of nodes much more highly interconnected than a random set of nodes can be. So there are several algorithms to extract community and we took a well-known one uh, based, based on maximizing uh, a quality indicator of uh, community division. 
Um, in this presentation, I just highlight a few communities. I just highlight five communities because they are easily interpretable. Uh, the interpretation that I made is done through the most important users in the community. So that does not mean that all the community have this interpretation, but it is a global interpretation. The biggest community here found is led by anti-vax or anti-sanitary pass account. And we find again the account that we have seen on the previous slide. Another, the second biggest community here um, is composed of, let's say, official information about the pandemic. We have the account of the Minister of Health. We have the official account of the Ministry of Health. We have the official account of the French government. And we also have two accounts here and here of famous doctors or professors uh, often seen in the medias. We have here a journalist. And here we have an engineer who developed a web platform containing a lot of statistics and information on the pandemic. Then we have two communities related to, uh, to media. Uh, we have the uh, news TV channel. So in France, we have four news TV channels. Uh, we found also some newspaper here. These are uh, newspapers. And we found also some uh, journalist, for instance, here, or magazine. This is a magazine. And I want also to present a smaller community here, but uh, with the particularity to have a lot of government members, among them the President Macron, the French Prime Minister, the government spokesperson, the official account of the French president and the Minister of Interior. Here is the big picture. This is the picture of the network of the French side. So I just put this picture just to realize, to realize how big the network is. I remind you that a node, for instance, here is a Twitter account. This is another Twitter account. And there is a link if there is a retweet action or a quote action. We see here the community of anti-vax or anti-pass accounts. In green, we have the health information. In orange and red, we have the medias and the journalists. And in dark blue, we have the government. So we, are, we have some work to do to interpret and to extract the, the, the other co communities and also to make the same thing on the Brazilian side. Uh, I remind that this is just a preliminary work. Um, now, I let uh, Jean-Fabrice conclude this uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Romain. So we next one. As as we as we started with, uh, we wanted to assess the perception uh, differences between two countries, France and Brazil. Um, first, first of all, it's mandatory to collect data in a rigorous way because without, without data, you cannot make any analysis, any interpretation. And you see, you need a lot of, not a lot of uh, computer and servers and so on, but you need an infrastructure that is reliable because only in 10 days and on one social network, we had uh, nearly 500,000 tweets. So if you do the same on, on one year, you need a resilient infrastructure and a solid, robust infrastructure. Mm, second, uh, second thing we can say about this uh, preliminary study, it's very interesting in terms of methodology because you see, we need to mix, not to mix, to alternate both qualitative 
and quantitative analysis. Quantitative analysis, because without any quantitative analysis, you cannot, for example, uh, define all the communities. You see in the, the picture of uh, the GFI graph, uh, it's very nice with a lot of colors, but without a quantitative analysis, you cannot find a visually, you know, it's very hard to find, uh, to find communities. So it's mandatory to have a quantitative analysis, but quantitative analysis is not enough. As uh, Romain has done, you need to analyze. That's the first analyze. Uh, analysis, but you, we we uh, we have to go deeper with this qualitative analysis. And qualitative analysis needs to better understand the context. We deeply understand the context of France, but for the context of Brazil, it's very hard for us to to analyze it, that, that. And third is that um, yes, we need both quantitative and qualitative, but step after step one step of quantitative of qualitative one step of quantitative one of qualitative one of so uh, it's very interesting because that shows that such studies cannot be made by just one guy but by a team so it's very important to have uh, to it requires a teamwork next slide to go to go further, first, uh, yes, we have to go deeper to analyze the communities and uh, the motivations of, uh, of these communities. We need to understand to this Brazilian context, and then after after that, we can go back to individual account and to analyze the role of. of the deep role of influencers and the course of actions of these influencers in each countries. So it's uh, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing research and uh, but uh, our first analysis will lead not to start just yes, writing. Uh, we can go with we we can refine our research question. And uh, that will lead to, I think, to good articles uh, with French and with Brazilian and French uh, authors. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if you have any question, we, we will be pleased to answer. No, there is no question. I think uh, that the research is very interesting. And uh, there is one uh, looking your research. We can see that the, there is a skepticism sentiment in France, much higher than in Brazil. And in Brazil, there is a strong uh, discussion, political discussion, because General, uh, in general, we don't have this discussion against vaccine here in Brazil, but you have the discussion, the political discussion to be against vaccine is to, is in some sense, correlated the, with the support of our president, because our president is against vaccine. Mm -hmm. So for this reason that uh, Bolsonaro and probably that tweet God is, is probably will be the against vaccine. But it's not skeptical. It's more, much more political than skepticism. Uh, so just one see. thing, just one, one thing. Um, there is one criteria that is that is not seen in this presentation that we have to take into account is the and I will speak only for the French uh, side because I know it better. We have to take into account the ability of users to use social networks. And for example, in France, people who were against anti-vax, for example, were much more talented using social networks than people who like <laughs> vaccine. So it may sometimes give a false impress of a lot of 
anti-vax, for example, but it's not in question of number. It's some, it may be, it may be in terms of ability to use social network. Yes, I think that probably this won't affect because generally people here use social media, uh, but the main social media uh, to support the president was not to eat. To eat is, is a social media, is net, is, we can consider a neutral social media because there are people favorable and against. The main social media uh, that the supporters of the president use uh, is WhatsApp. WhatsApp is the main media that the president and the and their supporters use. But uh, it's difficult to collect uh, data from WhatsApp because it's encrypted. It's and, very uh, hard, yes, to, it's very hard yes, to collect yes, data yes, from yes, WhatsApp, yes. Yes, uh, the main, but uh, again, this not, uh, not reduce your, your, collect, uh, your data collected because uh, this field that you noticed in your research is very, very true. Uh, here in Brazil, we have political sentiments, much more than anti-vax uh, sentiment. Anti-vax, passport, it's a discussion the, that exists uh, higher in Europe and uh, that there is no, this discussion is very, very few here in Brazil. Here in Brazil, we have the discussion I, I, uh, that there was corruption during this period. Uh, this, uh, you collect one very important uh, in the cloud, CPI, CPI. CPI is, uh, they are, there is one, one movement that was trying to investigate the corruption during the, the initial months, uh, the initiatives uh, that the federal government and public managers take related to COVID. You don't see, but you, you, you have a lot of propaganda, advertise of what we call uh, precoce treatment with chloroquine uh, and this generate a lot of uh, a lot of corruption that was uh, that it was being investigated now and uh, it's not concluded there is not a great conclusion but uh, what emerges is the political discussion, not the skeptical discussion in Brazil. And uh, for this reason that you see a lot of politicians in your uh, tweet collection. It's very different the discussion here from the France. Uh, the anti-vax is very, is very weak here. Uh, I don't know why if Janaina, Lisbeth, or even Chris may add no. something. Yeah, once, one, uh, Sorry, just no. one thing. Once again, it, it's not the real world. It's what is happening on a social network. In the, that case, Twitter. And it, sometimes it's very hard to make the difference between the real world, what you see every day, and what is on the social network. That's the difficulty of analysis. Yes, but your, your data is very clear. I think that your data is very clear. Is very, uh, the perception of the data is very good. Because in my view, it was, was occurring. The, the main difference between France and Brazil appears in your data. In your data, there, are, there is skepticism, anti-vax, there are discussions, scientific discussions, not here. We, can, we don't know if 
the antivax is really scientific, but there is some discussion about this. But in Brazil, the, there is a strong movement of vaccination. All the society have, and you have the one social health that promotes vaccination uh, for all the population. And for this, that you see in your cloud, SUS, as the, our social system, I, like in the national health system in England, there is a strong uh, national health system here in Brazil called SUS. And this national health system promotes vaccination. Vaccination is in, in the Brazilian culture. For this reason, that vaccine anti-vax is so weak. But you have the political movement uh, generated by the president. President is against vaccine. And for this reason, that there is this politicization, that there is this political movement that was created. And for this reason, the political movement is so strong, much more than the scientific discussion, the news discussion uh, here. Yeah. It's very, very, very good, this, this data that you find. Janaina, Lisbeth, Chris. I want to make two comments. I've gone. No, um, but just, uh, just an observation that the, the, the sample is very significant for, for, for the investigation because we can have immediately uh, a profile of the difference that are uh, taking place between the two, the two countries, the two situations, you see? And it is, uh, it is very interesting. Uh, as we had with the study cases in, in our research uh, in the cultural field, immediately you can see the difference. They appear, they come up, you see? So I think it, uh, it, was, it will be very much helpful for us to have this information and in, in to take it under consideration in our analysis. You see? Please, uh, Chris. And just two comments, very brief. Um, the first, I tend to think that this against movements are more organized, not necessarily talented, but they are more structured. They, they put more intention to their actions. And the other thing that uh, the Professor Indigar mentioned is related to the CPI that appears, the CP, CPI, that in that period, the 14th of July was exactly the period that they were planning, they were discussing the extension of the CPI that, that had started, I'm not sure, uh, April or May. And around that time, they were discussing to extend to more three months. So that, that was the bus, I suppose, that you were able to to filter in the, the hashtags, so just to add something. For your idea, Jean, uh, how WhatsApp probably was more used by the uh, social, the federal government of Bolsonaro, there is one called hate cabinet here. Uh, that was that, that uh, was created by the federal government, and this hate hate cabinet that spread fake news against vaccination and other political things that occurs. But uh, uh, Twitter, you have you have the two the two the against them favorable. So I can consider more neutral. And but Professor, please. sorry, I, I wanted to add something. And probably you won't be able to extract some particular words related to vaccine. For example, the coronavac vaccine that appeared in the Brazilian side, it definitely is that it, it probably is, is correlated to the alligator word, for example, that is not <laughs> a direct correlation, but 
in a specific context. We should, we, we should help them <laughs> to analyze and interpret yeah. the because <laughs> they are so it's hard. It's hard, it's hard to understand important. sometimes this yeah. correlation. If we, if we take the vaccine, we will transform into alligators. That one of the fake news. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. It was a joke, but then we, we transformed yeah. this into a pro-vax um, uh, slogan. And a lot of people took um, the vaccine and with a alligator, I, I myself, I did that with a toy. And just to prove I'm not going to, to be an alligator just because I'm taking the Chinese vaccine. And, just and, coming, on, and coming from a very fluent user, so. Yes. yes. Even the president <laughs> told yeah, that president he will be, will be transfer, changed through alligators. If they because if take a vaccine and become an alligator, it's a problem. That's what he said. <laughs> it's um, a clown. And just one more thing. Uh, I, I saw one of the exhibits and it was so interesting to see that in Twitter in Brazil, we have more uh, tweets about anger and in France about fear. So it's a reflection of our feelings. We are anger because we believe in vaccine. We, we want to take them and we see uh, news about corruption and delays and uh, fake news. So it's, it's us, we are anger, angry, I'm sorry. And that's it. So it's a different situation from France. And it's, it's very interesting to see they, this, with the, the numbers, and you will probably need some help from us to interpret this because it's so specific about Brazil and our culture. That's it, Congra congratulations, it's very interesting. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. And now uh, we will get in touch by mail or by exchange uh, to, go, to go further and to get your, uh, your impress and some of uh, your, uh, to support us to make this, uh, deeper analysis. Thank you. I will leave, leave you because <laughs> I, I have another... A, a uh, we, we are finishing. We are, I think that ah. we, we are finishing our discussion today. It was very good. I will open if someone uh, wants to talk about anything more, but uh, I'm so I'm so happy that you, our results are very good. And congratulations for your data collection. It was very, very good and exemplify our difference. Your, our difference of perceptions are very intense in this, this, this meaning that you present. It's very interesting, your data. Thank you very much for this positive feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> Goodbye. So, bye bye. <laughs> bye. We will Goodbye. Make contact Thank with you. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. See you.